We were just talking, I was just saying, I'm going to try and talk slow today. It's not going to happen because we'll be here forever because I got a lot to say today. A lot to say today. Happy summer. Or as I like to call it, show my legs off weather. So thank you very much. I apologize for the distraction. I know it's difficult, but eyes up here, eyes up here. All day, people, all day. Hey, welcome to those of you that are tuning in online. If you're out in the atrium enjoying the sunlight, great to have you here. If you're tuning in on demand, wonderful. Thank you for being with us today as we launch a brand new series called Unacceptable Truth. If you're here in the room, thank you for being here. If you're a guest this morning, maybe first time, second time, you've been around for a little bit, want to welcome you. Uh, I hope that you find yourself feeling very welcomed by everyone here, and I hope that you find yourself feeling invited by the divine reality we name God. Uh, and so uh, there is a reason you're here. I don't know, maybe just to check us off the list. Nope, not going back there. That could be the reason. I don't know. Uh, but there's probably some reason you're here. And so we're glad you're here with us today. Uh, I said, my name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads. And uh, inside of the program or on the website, if you're tuning in digitally, is my cell phone number. If you're a guest or you've been around a little bit and you have some questions, you want to get to know me, I'd love to get to know you, hear your story. Just send me a text message uh, right that is my actual cell phone number. Send me a text message. We'll set up a time for you to take me out for drinks. It'll be wonderful. And uh, I seriously, I let you buy. I, I know I, I, we're not going to fight over the check thing. I'm just going to let you take it. It's okay. No, no, we'll go out, have coffee. We'll do something. But I'd love to get to know you a little bit, answer any questions you might have. And I'm sure you will have some questions by the time this is done. All right. Um, it is good to, to be here, though. I love it. Hey, happy Pride Month to everyone. How many of you have a family member that's celebrating Pride Month in a very special way? Raise your hand up nice and high. We want you to know that you are seen and you are loved and you are welcomed and uh, just grateful that you're here and cross. Crossroads sees and understands that this is a challenging reality, being in a faith community when it comes to queerness. And uh, we see that. We recognize that much of the hurt and the harm that maybe you and your family have experienced has been at the hands of people like me or from me at a time in my own life. And, uh, and so we are grateful to be a space where it is safe for you to be who God has made you and created you to be. And so we're grateful for you to be here. And we're grateful to raise children in a spiritual environment that says we are all children children of God made in the image of God. And so that's what we're all about. And so we're committed to, to not just uh, being welcoming, but being affirming to stand with you and to recognize that there has been oppression and there has been pain and there has been evil perpetrated uh, oftentimes in the name of God and in the name of Jesus. Uh, so we're with you or here. So I'm going to ask you a question today. So loosen up, raise your hand to answer this question. If you want, you can answer it in your mind. Um, what comes to your mind when you hear the phrase or the statement, now don't think about it in church world because if you've been around here a while, hopefully what will come to mind is like, oh, Crossroads Church. But, you know, think about this. Like when you hear this phrase, that is unacceptable. What comes to your mind? What comes to your mind? That is unacceptable. Maybe uh, any parents in the house, raise your hand up nice and high. If you're a parent, maybe you've said that to a child throwing a fit in Walmart. 22 years old wanting candy. <laughs> that is unacceptable. No, I'm just kidding. Right? That is unacceptable. We, we, we say that, you know, we might say, it, you might say it more nicely than me, but that's unacceptable, right? Whatever it might be, right? Uh, maybe your, your, your kid was throwing a fit or mistreating their sibling. Like, that's not acceptable. That is unacceptable. It's not the way we treat one another, right? Uh, maybe you're in a relationship and perhaps you've said that to your spouse or your intimate partner. Uh, maybe you felt at times they weren't being kind and you said, that's not acceptable. Maybe you've been in an abusive relationship and at some point in that relationship, you found the support and the strength and the courage and maybe you just said it to yourself. This is unacceptable and you found the courage and the strength to leave. You know, maybe you grew up in a very rule-oriented religion and maybe you think of moral behaviors, right? When we hear that phrase unacceptable, you think of all the moral do's and don'ts that your church or your religion or your spirituality or your home told you, this is what you have to do and this is what you can't do, right? And the truth is we're all somewhat used to this idea of unacceptable behavior, right? Even in your own world, you, you can ascribe it to yourself. Healthy individuals, by the way, do recognize when they are acting in an unacceptable way. <laughs> 
right? If we never acknowledge that we're doing something that's unacceptable, we're doing something that's unkind, that I'm in the moment letting my emotions overrun my wisdom, right? And this is unacceptable. Like healthy people like recognize that. So we kind of get that, right? And, and, may, and we've probably said it or we've asked it of ourselves, right? Uh, and we've said, okay, is this acceptable? Is the way I'm thinking behaving? Is this something that's gonna be accepted in my workplace, in my marriage, with my children, right? Perhaps maybe you grew up in an environment where certain behaviors were acceptable, but now you go, why did we ever think those were okay? Right, maybe you grew up in an environment that was racist or sexist, and racist and sexist jokes were just part of the day. Some of us work in environments or have worked in environments where income equality is just perfectly normal and acceptable. For hundreds of years, thousands of years, Millennia in our, in our culture, in our world, slavery was seen as perfectly acceptable. It was a perfectly acceptable societal construct. This is just how it is. Some human beings were understood to be less than others. It was just acceptable. In the time of Jesus, people accepted that, hey, if you were sick or if there was something wrong with you, you were being punished by God. It was perfectly acceptable to leave you to, to go... And here's the thing, these acceptable behaviors that exist in our world, and there are some right now that we hold as a culture that are acceptable, but in like a hundred years, our answer, like, they're going to be like, I can't believe they did that. Like, there's going to come a day, I really do believe, I don't know when, but I believe it's going to come where people go, they actually thought it was okay to kill one another and call it war. Like, there will come a time, I really do believe that, but, there, but there's a behaviors right now that we just say are acceptable, but here's... Here's how we justify it, right? We justify our acceptable behaviors with three kind of big things, I think. I think we justify acceptable behaviors with religion, politics, and economics. Can I get an amen? How many of you are super excited you came to church today? (laughs) I figured if I talk about all three, I can offend everybody equally, right? (laughs) So here we go. This is how we justify our behavior. You think of the things that I mentioned earlier, racism, sexism, right? Uh, The income equality gap, like all of these things we've justified with these before, the oppression of women in the church, like we've done it. Politicians, if you're a politician in here, that's okay. It's all right. It's a noble thing. Not all politicians are bad, not all religious people, but here's the thing. Politicians tend to justify murder and they call it national defense. Right? I mean, and I'm not talking about just America. I'm talking about the world. Like, that's what we do. We call it war and we justify murder. Right? And we say, oh, no, it's just national defense. It's we have a right to defend our borders. We have a right to defend our nation. Okay? Now, we can talk about that. But the truth is, let's just talk about for just a second, and I know you all are going to love that I brought this up. Let's just talk about the Israel-Hamas conflict right now. 8,000 children have died. 8,000 children have died in this conflict. That's murder. It's murder. I mean, we can justify it and we can call it whatever we want to, but at the end of the day, 8,000 children's futures were taken away from them and we justify it with a word like just war theory or national defense. And, and it's perfectly acceptable. Let's just be honest. If it were acceptable, it, it, it's just acceptable. This is just what it is. It's unfortunate, but it is acceptable. That's the truth of it. That's how we justify and make behavior acceptable. And we do it in politics. We also do it in religion. Can I just pick on myself? Right? People that have jobs like mine, religious leaders, we justify abuse and we call it spiritual authority. Can I get an amen? We justify telling people how to live their lives, what to do, what not to do, what to believe. We justify telling people, like warping their sense of identity, warping their sense of God, right? To control, to manipulate, to raise money. All this happens in the the name of religion. And we just justify it by calling it spiritual authority. And we have a Bible verse for it. Like that's what happens. It doesn't take long, right? To find the latest story or documentary of spiritual leaders using their influence and their power to manipulate and take advantage of a member of a church. It just doesn't take long to find that story. It doesn't take long to find that documentary on Netflix. 
I don't know why, but there's some family members in my household that are totally into those right now. Like there's a whole genre of like why Ryan's profession sucks and they watch it all the time. I'm like, do you all realize like this is putting food on the table. Can we just give me a day? Give me a day, right? Podcast, it's all there. Economics, right? Economists justify things like poverty. And what do we call it? Meritocracy. Poverty, it's just gonna exist. We live in a society where it's just a meritocracy. You work hard, you'll get rewarded for it. If you don't work hard, that's on you. I mean, this is the reality. A meritocracy is in economics. It's talking about a system where resources and opportunities and rewards are just distributed based on individual talent and effort and achievement. That's how it works. There's not any other factors like social class or systemic injustices. There's no issues of inheritance. There's no issues of land rights. There's none of that. It's just about working hard. Yet the truth is poverty in our nation, which I love, by the way, I don't know why when we like speak in any way, shape or form, like, like that presses the narrative that everything is perfect in our country, that somehow you hate our country. That's not true. I mean, a more perfect union feels like a wonderful phrase in my opinion. But in America, poverty disproportionately affects children, racial and ethnic minorities, women and the elderly. And unless you want to present a case that children are lazy, well, okay, that, let's set that one aside. Okay. Unless you want to present a case that children and racial and ethnic minorities and women and the elderly are lazy and don't, don't deserve to participate in the meritocracy, right? It just kind of falls apart. There are issues there. And Jesus, right, the one who many of us in this room are modeling our lives, we're walking down this peacemaking path, following this way of life, this way of interacting with the divine, this way of being in our world. Jesus lived in a time where certain behaviors were completely acceptable. And those behaviors led to completely unacceptable truths like poverty and neglect. Women were marginalized and treated as less than in Jesus's world. The poor were seen as cursed and excluded. And these acceptable behaviors, they also included demeaning children, hating Samaritans, forbidding interracial marriages. That's all in our Bible, by the way. <laughs> it's all there. It's all right there. And so what happens here, this is, the, this is the deep and profound truth that I have for you. I mean, this is as good as it's gonna get this next fill-in, okay? I mean, it's all downhill from here. The next 45 minutes is just wasted time. I'm just kidding. It's going to be 50. Okay, listen. <laughs> acceptable behaviors are what lead to unacceptable truths. See, it's the acceptable behaviors that lead to the unacceptable truths of our world. It's when we accept certain things as okay that the result, the fruit, is an unacceptable truth. So things like poverty and human trafficking and economic inequality and suicide rates in general, and especially in the queer community in particular, starvation, death from preventable diseases, all of these are unacceptable truths that are related to acceptable behaviors, acceptable public policies, acceptable ways of functioning and living in the world right now. And here's the truth of it. We cannot confront the unacceptable truths that we talk about here at our church. We cannot work to rewrite them without what? Confronting our acceptable behavior. Whew. I'm glad we're receiving donations at the end and not right now because nobody would give a cent after that one. It's like, wait, Ryan, are you telling me that I'm actually contributing to the unacceptable realities of this world? Yes, we are. We are. And you don't have to live under this weight of guilt and woe is me, but until we accept that, until we start going, okay, what are the ways in which I live that I might not even know about, that I might be doing in complete ignorance, that are actually perpetrating a system of racism, that are actually perpetrating economic injustice, that are actually perpetrating a, a lack of access to education, right? These things that are just perfectly acceptable that I don't even feel bad about, okay? I do it, and I'm the pastor. But I always said I'm not a good one, so that's okay. 
But listen, we just have to like own that and be okay with it. It's called grace. Like that's why common grace is such a beautiful theological concept, right? And so we have, to, we have to, first of all, address the acceptable behaviors so that we can then take action and move towards rewriting the unacceptable truths that flow out of them. Does that make sense? Raise your hand, I'm nice and high if that makes a little bit of sense. Give me a checkbox in the chat, a one, a thumbs up, a something, because that's a little complex. And it's a little turn of phrase, but it is true that what we accept as okay inevitably turns into oppression. Oppression doesn't happen because we, we think, oh, let's not do this. <laughs> Oppression happens because we think this is what we should do because these people deserve it. All right, Jesus knew this, okay? Jesus knew this. And he tells us this beautiful story uh, in, in, in the Gospel of Luke. And you might have heard this uh, parable, this story of what is traditionally called the Good Samaritan. How many have ever heard that? The Good Samaritan, which in and of itself is a racist title. I always like to point that out to everybody, <laughs> right? This should just be the story of the generous, wise, wonderful Samaritan. <laughs> like, but Jesus tells us this story and in it we find that what is Jesus is doing is what he's always doing is addressing what is acceptable because if we can address what is acceptable, the other things will follow, right? The unacceptables will shift. So Luke chapter 10, this is how the story goes. It says an expert in the law, a religious leader, not unlike myself. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. And he says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, got to pause right here because some of us, when we hear eternal life, we go back to like a tradition or we go back to a part of our world where we're thinking, oh, this is about heaven and hell. Okay, not about heaven and hell. Okay, those concepts of heaven and hell were developed much later than the time of Jesus. Okay, okay. So we can't put on to this question a, a, a question that would not have existed at the time. Eternal life definitely speaks to like quantitative, but it is really addressing the quality of life. What must I do to inherit, to have this life that's full? And the question was arising about resurrection and it had been for about 100 years or so coming into the life of Jesus. There was hot debate about would there be a resurrection and was there this life after this death? But for the most part in the Jewish tradition, like you just died, you went to the place of the dead. It was called Sheol. It was neither good or bad. It was just there. And in the tradition, it was just like, leave it alone. And, and like the, the political leaders, the religious leaders, they didn't like it when you messed around with it. They were just like, let's just leave the dead to the gods and we'll just move on in life, right? And so this question comes to Jesus, right? Which is probably a question when it says to test him, to put Jesus on his side. Are you, a, are you with the political party of the Pharisees? who were, they were resurrectionists, or are you in the political party with the Sadducees who were non-resurrectionists, right? These were basically political parties. Think of them like Democrats and Republicans, okay? And you can choose whichever side you want, right? So he says, how do I do this? So it, remember, eternal life, when you hear eternal life, you have to go beyond heaven and hell, all right? And, and it's not merely this duration, but it really is a distinct nature of a way of life that is lived now and into eternity, right? Into the future, that's a way of living that's hidden in the way of Jesus, right? By the time that the Gospel of John was written, which is after Matthew, the Gospel of John is probably our latest gospel, super theological in nature, all kinds of metaphors in there. By that point in time, it had come to be known that eternal life was knowing Jesus. Like there's a passage in John chapter 17 where Jesus says, knowing me like is eternal life. Like that's, that's the, Jesus doesn't actually say it, the writer John does, but he, this idea of real life, genuine life is knowing Jesus, okay? So just make sure you bracket when you hear eternal life. Don't go into like, oh, this guy's asking, you know, how do I go to heaven? That's a, probably a bit of the question, but that's not the majority of the question, all right? Make sense? All right, six of you are still with me. Whew, okay, here we go. So Jesus says to him, well, what's written in the law? How do you read it, right? So what's Jesus doing here? He's saying, hey, tell me your interpretation. Like, let's talk about this. What is it that you think God desires of you? What do you think are the requirements? Because, right, this guy's like, I want to inherit this kind of life. I want to inherit eternal life. What do I have to do? Jesus isn't quizzing him on his Bible knowledge, right? He's trying to get a sense of his spiritual disposition. He's trying to get a sense of how does this this, this scribe, this lawyer, basically, how does he read the text? How does he understand God? And so the, the scribe says, well, 
you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, ding, 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 ding. You get to go on to double jeopardy. Great question. Great answer, I mean, great answer. You got it. You've given the right answer. And then he, he, <laughs> then he says, do this and you will live. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but this is kind of one of those moments where I go, the Bible is a terrible rule book. Because what does that mean to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? I feel like I would want some more specifics. <laughs> Like, what does that actually mean? And that's what Jesus is driving home. So to love God, what does that mean? Does that mean go to church all the time, right? Does that mean read my Bible all the time? Does that mean memorize the Torah? What does it mean to love God? And so he says, go ahead, you got it, do it, and you'll live. Like, question answered. And I think it's, I just love Jesus, right? I mean, he's just, I'm, I'm accused of not loving Jesus, which is ironic, but I think it's fantastic what he says here. He's like, go for it, you got it. And he's trying to end the conversation. But here's the trick, right? The scribe, the religious leader, wanting to vindicate himself, wanting to justify his acceptable behavior. That's what it means to vindicate ourselves. He asked this question, and this was the question that he should have never asked. Well, who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? You see, here's the thing about unhealthy spirituality. Unhealthy spirituality always justifies who not to love. It always seeks to justify its acceptable way of who I don't have to love. And it's popular and it feels so good, but it's unhealthy and it's dangerous. But you all know nothing of that. But that's what this man's trying to do. And so Jesus says to him, okay, here's a story. <laughs> I love it. How many of you had a parent who, who like gave you life lessons and stories? Did anybody have one of those? Like I didn't, but I think it'd be great to have like that parent who like you asked about like, should I ask him out? And they were like, well, let me tell you a story. And then like two days later, you're like, I, okay, I don't know what to do, right? But that was Jesus. He would teach in stories according to some of the gospels, right? And so Jesus replies, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and took off, leaving him half dead, okay? So let's get a little context for the parable because how many of you have traveled from Jericho to Jerusalem? Okay, good, I haven't either, right? So let's get a little geographical context for the story because everybody listening, first of all, they're all Jews that are listening and they would understand that this, this journey was quite interesting. So the road from Jer Jericho to Jerusalem is about 17 miles long. You can kind of see it up here. This is the whole Mediterranean area, right? Now you can't really see Jerusalem and Jericho here, but we're talking about this big area of the world. I don't know if you know it or not, this is still a hotly contested piece of land, right? <laughs> so Jericho, Right, this ancient city, it lies in the Jordan Valley, so it lies low, and it's about 900 feet below sea level, okay? That's where it is. And to go to Jerusalem, you would literally go up, right? Because Jerusalem sat on top of a mount, right? And it was 2,500 feet above sea level. Now, for those of you that aren't good at math, I'll do it for you. That is a 3,300 foot elevation gain over 17 miles, right? That's, so just to put it in perspective, uh, if you did Long's Peak, right? Long's Peak from the trailhead to the top, it's like seven miles one way, and it's about 5,000 feet of elevation gain, and it is a brutal hike. Can I get an amen from those of you that have done it? <sighs> One of the dumbest things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> so this is a long, very difficult road. It's desolate, it's dangerous. You can kind of see that this is the terrain that it passes through, right? So you're just kind of going straight up, 17 miles, heat of the day, right? And it's, it's known if you ever read in scripture, or if you ever hear like the Judean wilderness, this is the area, right? The Judean wilderness. So it was very dangerous. Um, it was known for people being uh, robbed, beaten, right? This is just like, it made total sense to the people hearing it. Right? So they were like, oh, yeah, I know that road. I've been there before. And you wouldn't take another route because it would take too long a lot of times. So you just like, this was what you did. And you traveled. This was the road to travel to if you were doing commerce in Jerusalem, whatever it might be. It was just, a, it was, it would evoke immediately a sense of peril and darkness, all that good stuff. Okay. 
And, this, and so Jesus so he sets the scene. This is the road. Now, by chance, Jesus says, there was a priest going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Right? Can I get an amen? Like, I'm not touching that. That's gross. I don't have any gloves. I'm not adequately trained. <laughs> Walks by on the other side. And then Jesus says, so likewise, a Levite. He came and he placed and he saw him and he passed by on the other side. Now, why would the priest and the Levite pass by on the other side, right? Well, there's a couple of reasons why they might have done that, right? First of all, they might have feared disappointing God. How many of y'all ever been afraid of that one? Right, both the priests and the Levites were subject to these very intense purity laws. They could not do their work if they were ceremonially unclean. And you can read all about ceremonial cleanness in Numbers chapter 19, one of the most inspiring books of the Bible, <laughs> right? And so they couldn't go up to, they couldn't perform their temple duties if they had come into contact with a dead body. And so if they thought the man was dead, right, it would, it would mean, okay, I would be disappointing God. And so for these religious figures, maintaining that ritual purity was probably a significant aspect of their understanding of their faith and their religious obligation. And they might have believed that preserving their ability to perform their temple duties was more important than helping an individual in distress. It'd be like, on your way to church, you see somebody whose car broke down and you think, I can't be late to church, and so you just keep driving. Not that anybody's ever done that. <laughs> it got real quiet there. <laughs> like, did you just call me a priest? That's what, listen, okay, so that's just kind of what they thought. Now, they might have been afraid for their own safety, right? They could have thought, it's a trap, right? They could have thought, hey, there's this guy laying on the side of the road. It's an ambush. They're just waiting for somebody to come by and help them. So uh, being afraid for their own safety, they don't go over there. They're, I'm not going to become a victim myself. Maybe they feared not living up to the expectations of other people. Right? They were priests and Levites. And I can actually understand this. Sometimes there's all these weird expectations that get put on people in my profession, and sometimes people in my profession love those expectations. I just choose to disappoint you immediately, and we can get that out of the way. <laughs> but like, maybe they're just afraid, like if I become ceremonially unclean, people will expect, they'll wonder, how, what did they do? Why didn't they, 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 they like preserve their, their ritual purity? Right? Maybe they thought that, that people had all these expectations and if they stopped and they couldn't perform their duties, they would be judged. I'll be judged. It was a risk to their reputation. People would start talking. I wonder what they did to become ceremonially unclean. They start emailing one another, texting, tagging each other, cancel culture right there in Jerusalem. Did you know that that priest was ceremonially unclean? And I don't know what he did, but he must have done something. And so there's like this reputation hit, possibly. All of these were fears that could have been present in the priest and the Levite in that moment. And I think they're all genuine fears. But I think it's important that we recognize that the priest and the Levite, no matter what it was, they were moved with fear in that moment. Fear was in control. And again, this is the danger, this is the fruit of unhealthy religion and unhealthy spirituality. It's driven by fear. And so fear animated and it motivated the priest to move away from the victim, away from the oppressed. But Jesus says, a Samaritan while traveling came upon him. And when he saw him, he wasn't moved with fear, but he was moved with compassion. Now, for those of you that might not be aware, some of you are aware, uh, Samaritans and Jews in this time frame had not a lot of love lost for each other. The Samaritans were a group of people that emerged um, with a, a shared heritage from the Jews. But in 722, the Assyrians came and destroyed what was called the Northern Kingdom at the time. And then those that remained in the Northern Kingdom that weren't taken into exile, they intermarried and they kind of formed a new people group in their intermation, and this became known as the Samaritan community. And the Samaritan community, um, had shared, they shared similar beliefs, but they were different than the Southern community of Judea, where Jerusalem sat. Now the Bible, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, the Pentateuch, the prophets, you have to understand, those are written from the perspective of the Northern Kingdom, okay? 
So part of engaging with scripture is understanding some of this stuff, that there is, there is political propaganda in our text. That's okay, it just is what it is, because it was written from the perspective of the Judean kings. So that makes sense, and, and really probably not even the kings, but from a group of leaders who wanted to see the nation look a certain way. I mean, I don't know if you know that people have different perspectives on how a nation should be run. Like that happens sometimes. <laughs> And Israel was no different. Ancient Israel was no different, okay? So like in the Samaritans, they only held the Pentateuch, the first five books as their, their scripture. They didn't hold the rest. They didn't, the writings and the prophetic books because they were really filled with, in their opinion, propaganda. So the Samaritans believed that you were supposed to worship on Mount Gerizim. So if you're familiar with some of the writings of the Pentateuch, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, there's this like cryptic phrase that says, in the place that the Lord your God or Yahweh your God will establish is where you're supposed to worship. And it would eventually for the southern kingdom become Jerusalem, but for the northern kingdom, it would become Mount Gerizim. And that was a bit of tension. <laughs> Why? Because you want the capital because it would bring in all the commerce. It's all politics and economics, by the way. I mean, conflict is politics and economics most of the time. And it's the same in ancient Israel. And so you have this, this history, this long history that, it, that actually kind of boiled over in 138 BCE when the Judean leader went and destroyed the temple on Mount Gerizim in an attempt to control the Samaritans. And so by the time of Jesus, it was still destroyed. It never was rebuilt, but the Samaritans still worshiped on that temple. And so there was not any love lost there. There was a lot of hatred. There was a lot of social upheaval. And, and there was disdain for one another, a lack of trust for each other from both perspectives. And so when Jesus said a Samaritan came down and he's talking to a primarily Jewish audience, they knew it right away. And Jesus intentionally does this, I believe it, because he knew that a religion that accepted neglect, fear, and hatred was unacceptable. Like he knew that part of his religion had taken certain behaviors and labeled them as acceptable. It is okay to hate the Samaritans. It is okay to exclude the Samaritans because they don't worship the right way. They don't believe the right way. They're not our religion. They intermarried. They're not pure. These are all the phrases. And so Jesus is flipping the script. He's showing that real life, eternal life, is not found in religion or rule following. Can I get an amen? amen. That's what Jesus is doing here. And Jesus goes on, he says, so this Samaritan goes and he bandages his wounds and he treats him with oil and wine and he put him on his own animal and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, which is basically like two days wages for a Roman soldier. And he gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever it takes. I mean, this is amazing. The Samaritan invested time and talent and treasure for the peace and the well-being of the victim who everyone in the room would have assumed was Jewish, okay? All, I mean, Jesus' audience, when he said, hey, there was a man traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem, they would have all said, oh, he was a Jew. So you have this Samaritan who's now caring for and, and giving of his time, stopping, changing plans, turning around, traveling the road again, using his talents. He bandaged the wounds. He treated them. Giving of his treasure. He paid the innkeeper. He made a commitment to, to pay whatever it takes, right? All this stuff. Jesus knew what he was doing in the hearts of his listeners. And they're all discombobulated right now. They're all disoriented. And Jesus lands the plane. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Remember the question, who's my neighbor? Well, which one do you think is the neighbor? And this guy <laughs> couldn't even say the word Samaritan. But he answers the question brilliantly. He says, the one who showed him mercy. The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. So what's the original question? What does it take to inherit eternal life? What does it take to get real life? What does that look like? Well, love God, love others. Well, okay, so go do that. Well, but who's my neighbor? Okay, let's have this conversation. And then Jesus brings and says, well, who's your neighbor? Who was the neighbor in that story? It's the one who showed mercy. And so this, this legal mind <laughs> makes Jesus' point. 
Jesus doesn't say, oh, it's the one who went to the temple. It's the one who maintained temple purity. It's the one who had right doctrine. It's the one who believed all the right things. It's the one who prayed the prayer. It's the one who took communion this way. The one who baptized their babies this way. None of that nonsense. That was wrong. It's not nonsense. It can be very beautiful. But when it becomes the thing, we have to call it something so that we can bring it back to its proper place to support the life of mercy. And so Jesus brings this beautiful, brand new vision of what a faithful life can be. He reimagines it. He says, this is, this is totally the, the vision I have for what a faithful life looks like, and it's not what my religion gave me. And he presents that. And what's beautiful is that the Samaritan, right, didn't need the temple, didn't need the Jewish law, to know what righteousness looked like. Didn't need any of it. He moved past his fears. I'm sure they were there. And he reached down and he says, it is unacceptable for me to walk by. I know that my culture tells me I'm not supposed to care for this person, that I should probably actually celebrate that this Jew is now hurting on the side of the road. And I could actually say that God did that. That's a punishment from God, but he moves past all of that stuff. And he says, nope, I'm gonna stop. And he knew that real life was found in participating in the healing of the wounded, that that was eternal life, that that was knowing Jesus. That's what the story's all about. So here's what I don't want us to miss as I'm halfway into the message. Here's what I don't want us to miss. Through this parable, Jesus reimagined a faithful vision of what he would call the kingdom of God, and it was compassion and action. It wasn't religion and rules. It was compassion and action. This was the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, Jesus said what? Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the realm of the divine and divine righteousness, which is what? It's not rule following. It's not morality. It's mercy. That's what righteous, the way you treat one another and all these things will then be given to you. He's talking about like wondering what you're gonna wear, what you're gonna eat, the stresses of life. But if you put first mercy, if you put first the care of the wounded on the side of the road, all these things will be added. In Romans, Paul says this, for the kingdom of God is not found in food and drink. In other words, the kingdom of God is not found in moral rule following. That's what he's talking about there. What you're allowed to eat, what you're allowed to drink, what you don't eat, what you don't drink, no. The kingdom of God, the reign of God is righteousness and peace and joy found in the spirit of God, in that life of mercy. And so it makes perfect sense when in Jesus begins his ministry in the gospel of Luke chapter four, and he walks into his synagogue and they hand him a scroll and he unrolls the scroll and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. This is, a, I, this, I get so frustrated. These aren't, these are tears of anger. Can I just be real honest with you? Because I think we're missing it and I don't think anybody's listening. <laughs> and I've sat in rooms with the leaders and, and but geez, the story's beautiful. And I don't even believe that Jesus actually did this because I don't think that the historical Jesus could actually read. It makes no sense that the historical Jesus could actually read. But in our story, he can read. And the story is presenting a deep truth. And this is right in front of us. And you can believe that this actually happened, by the way. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Let's just, we come together and we say, what does it mean? Okay, so don't be freaked out when I say, I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter to me whether the historical Jesus actually read this because this is teaching me what the historical Jesus was all about. And people say, well, what is the gospel? It's right here. The word good news is the Greek word for gospel. There's, I don't know what we're debating about. For the writer of Luke, the gospel, the message, the point of it was that Jesus had been anointed by God and his understanding of God to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to those who were oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolls up the scroll and he dropped the mic and he left. And you know what happened? They tried to stone him. And I can tell you it's the same thing that's going to happen It's the same thing that happens when you push against those acceptable behaviors and acceptable beliefs. There's always the crowd that wants to stone you. 
There's always the people that want to uninvite you for Thanksgiving dinner because you won't sit and toe the line anymore. Why? Because you have found salvation. And it might be completely different than the idea of salvation that you and I were raised in. It might not be. And now the big question that Jesus asked was, who's the neighbor? But there's another question hidden in this story that is really important, and it's where is the divine? Where is God in this story? And so we often read this story with this idea that the divine is found in the Samaritan's actions, that that that's God at work. But I read this story differently, surprise, surprise. (laughs) I read it a little bit more subversively, a little bit more transformatively, because I think that the divine, that God in the story is the beaten man on the side of the road. And I feel like that's what the tradition tells me because we trust that God was present on the cross, dying, suffering in Jesus. So why wouldn't where the suffering is, God be? See, the rule of the divine kingdom, the ruler of the divine kingdom, this reign of God is not the one in power, it's not the victor, but it's always the victim. That's the subversive reality of of what I think authentic Jesus following in Christianity is. It's finding God not in power, but in the victim. Because it's the victim that transforms us. It's the victim that changes us. And we stand and say that God is incarnate in the suffering. And so if you want to experience God, I hate to break the news to you, church really isn't the best place to do it. I mean, mean, it's a place. And it can if we do it right. But you wanna really experience God, go where there's suffering. Go into the dark corners of this world and give of yourself and you will be transformed. And you will become merciful and you will become generous. And you will never, ever, ever get angry when we fundraise. (laughs) You will never, ever get angry when there are opportunities to serve because you have got into proximity with pain and you've met Jesus. And so I take great offense when people say that Jesus isn't in our church or that I don't know Jesus. And it's usually people in power that wanna say that. But I have never met Jesus more powerfully than when I've stood by the oppressed and when I've had to confront my own oppressive ways and be transformed. That's the power of God. That's redemption, but that takes a lot. And so in our everyday normal lives, when we recognize that the beaten one is the divine, right? We experience transformation when we do a couple of things, when we identify with the marginalized. When we say, okay, (laughs) that's where God is. I've got to go and understand. I I have to set aside the acceptable ways of thinking about the poor. I have to set aside the acceptable ways of thinking about this political party or that political party. I have to set aside the acceptable ways of thinking about vengeance and violence. And I have to go sit with those who are victims of the vengeance and the violence, who are victims of the hatred, who are victims of the fundamentalist attitudes in either side, by the way. And so when we read the divine in the beaten man, right, we're aligning ourselves with the deep theology that the incarnation of God was found in the marginalized Jesus. He existed in the margins of his, I mean, he was homeless. He was homeless. He was was considered a traitor. He was crucified as a criminal. That is, you don't get much more marginalized And so if you want to seek Jesus and live, then we have to seek and we have to organize ourselves and get into those spaces. And this is what we see throughout the Gospels. Jesus is constantly finding himself right in the middle of the outcasts and the poor and the suffering. And this to me suggests that that is where God is present. Because Jesus said, I am about my father's business. And they would come to Jesus. And so we identify with the marginalized and we find transformation and we find healing of ourselves in that moment. And then the other thing we can do when we identify is to give non-judgmental, radical compassion. It had been real easy for the Samaritan, for this, the priest to walk by and be like, well, why was that guy traveling by himself? He deserves it. 
or to walk by and say, that's what you get for worshiping in Jerusalem. That's what you get. That's what you get for destroying my temple, you filthy animal. And dehumanize it. And it could, but, that's, but, but there was this radical, non-judgmental compassion that was present. And that transforms us. And it's the act of compassion itself that transforms us. I mean, there is a spirituality that puts goosebumps on the arms. Don't get me wrong, but it doesn't produce transformation of how we spend our money and our time and, and how we think about the world, really renewing our minds. I mean, there's an energy that flows in different ways of singing that are powerful, and I've been in it all. But what's interesting, at the end of the day, where's the love? And I still hold to this beautiful passage that says they will know we are followers of Jesus by our love. And even the earliest father Jesus in the Roman Empire, the, the, the early Roman, Roman emperors, they had no idea what to do with these people because <laughs> they, they were treating the Roman sick better than the Romans treated them. Like when plagues would come in, it was the Christians that would come and care for them in a non judgment act of radical compassion. I mean, sociologists have studied this. Like they didn't even know what to do. Emperors have written like, we don't know what to do with these people. We want to get rid of them, but we kind of need them because they take care of our poor and they take care of our sick better than we do. It's unfortunate that that's not necessarily the same thing that's said today of followers of Jesus. But there are followers of Jesus that I think are living that out and at least trying to. I don't do it very well. I don't do it perfect. We don't, but we're trying to. We're trying to live that out. The Samaritan's mercy is not just an act of kindness. It's a recognition of the sacredness of the beaten man's life. Here's a thought for you. And I did tell everybody that this is gonna be a long message, okay? I did say that. Death hurts usually because we have an emotional attachment to a personality, a person, a thing, okay? Follow me. So we, we have a person we love because we know them and they die and our world shifts. We talked about this, if you didn't watch the, the broadcast from last week, go back and watch it. Randy did a great job, we talked about this, but like your universe shifts because a part of your identity is, a huge part of our identity is defined in relationships. And so a relationship ends, whether it be with a beloved pet, whether it be with a friend, a family member, whatever it might be. So death happens, but here's the thing, Death is happening all over the world and it doesn't affect you or I. Can we be honest? Like that. Why? Because we haven't yet come to the recognition of the sacredness of life. <laughs> I haven't. I don't weep when I watch the news. Well, that's not true, sometimes we do. But then I move on. It doesn't change my life. And until we recognize the sacredness of life, which is what the gospel is saying, which is what the story is saying, is that man beaten on the side of the road, it's, this, it's the sacredness, it's the divine right there. That will usher in the kingdom of God when that happens. And the lion will lay down with the lamb. And we will beat our swords into plowshares. See, these are all beautiful metaphors of a reality that we're called to be a part of creating here and now. And waiting for it to happen is not a good battle plan. <laughs> waiting for it to happen is not a good plan of transformation. Participating in the ways in which we can, no matter how small they might be, is beautiful. And that's the life of a peacemaker. And that will make the world a better place because reimagining a faithful vision of the kingdom of God, of the Christian life, of all that will open our eyes to these unacceptable truths that create victims all over the globe and we'll begin to see and we'll understand our acceptable behaviors that contribute to spiritual emptiness and poverty and illiteracy and fear of the other and modern day slavery. And when we recognize it and when we first of all just deal with the acceptable behavior in ourselves, right? we'll start to rewrite these unacceptable truths. And then guess what? We'll be bringing new, good news to the poor. 
We'll be proclaiming release to the captives. We'll be offering sight to the blind. We'll be setting free those who are oppressed. And see, I actually believe that Jesus, the point of Jesus was not to show us how to be divine. I think the point of Jesus is to show us how to be human. I don't think Jesus came to show us, hey, this is how you can be divine and this is how you can be perfect and we want that and I get it. But I really do believe that Jesus came to show us and Jesus recognized he had this opportunity to say, this is what it looks like to be human, to be fully human, to be fully alive. And there's a cost to that. And so I wanna encourage you to stick with us the next six weeks. Tune in if you're traveling, be a part of it, be present with this spiritual journey called Unacceptable Truth, Reimagining a Faithful Vision. And we're gonna explore these unacceptable truths each week. And here's the really good news. This was a long message because the next ones are short. Yeah, I'm getting a hand of applause, finally. Always takes longer to set up the problem than it does to start with the solution. So listen, each week I'm gonna share for a few minutes just a high overview of the thing and then we're gonna have an interview with an expert. And we're gonna talk with someone who's really thinking through spiritual emptiness, with somebody who's thinking through poverty at the societal level, at the community level. And we're gonna to get to here. And then each week we're gonna push out through the app uh, about three daily readings throughout the week where you can read and learn about some resources. And then each week I'm gonna give you a way in which you can stop at the side of the road and bind up the brokenhearted with a local experience that on your own time, in your own way, you can connect with. So we'll, we'll share with you, here's a resource that's working to end poverty in Northern Colorado. Go learn about what they're doing. Just go see it, go experience it. And we'll help you do that. But it's up to you, right? Like I can only lead a horse to water. You got a drink, right? And, and so it, it's in those moments. So, so I wanna encourage you to make space for that. So as we have communion together here, we're gonna sing, they're gonna sing a great song during this time. I wanna encourage you this week to download the app, participate in the spiritual journey, click push notifications for spiritual journeys and you'll get those notifications when they come out. It, it, it's not gonna be like every Monday, was, it'll be like one week, it'll be Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, one week, it'll be Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> Just read it whenever you can, okay? We're kind of disorganized in that respect. Why? Because I have to write it and sometimes I don't, it takes me a little while to get things done. <laughs> All right, so, so do that. I wanna encourage you to do that. Participate in the journey. I wanna encourage you to commit to make space this summer for some, some transformational experiences to stop on the side of the road. I, I just, I, I wish that coming here was, this, was, was what it took. <laughs> but I really wanna encourage you when you see those opportunities, just take those next steps and go and visit and learn and understand and allow the Spirit of God to work in your life because maybe one or two of the unacceptables really connect with you. One of the dreams I have is that over this five-week period, what will emerge are five leaders in our church that want to be champions of each of the unacceptables and that you'll want to help put together a group of people that will, that will take us on the journey, that will equip us to be a part of it and that we could form a little council of unacceptable people. <laughs> And you might have a real passion and you might say, I wanna, I wanna just kind of do some organizing and you might be able to organize us and work with our partners in Hope Leadership, but that's kind of a dream I have that, that what would emerge in this is that what God's doing in your heart would be shaped to encourage us and help us as a church community and that you'd be released into that. And then I wanna encourage you, if there is ever a message that was just meant to manipulate you, it's this one, <laughs> to get a ticket and come to the gala. Right, I mean, this is one of the easiest ways that you can help rewrite the unacceptable truths. Just set aside some money and come and participate and have fun and, and bid on an auction item here or there, way overpay for things, right? But come out and support these organizations and what they're doing and grab your ticket today and come out and just be a part of that night. Bring a friend with you, buy an extra ticket today. Believe that you will make a friend this week and that that friend will come with you to the gala. I have faith in you. 
Maybe this is all new and you're like, what is going on? What kind of church did I just walk into? I think it's a real special community. I think it's been a special community for 27 years and I'm privileged to get to be a part of it right now. I was only one when it was founded, so. <laughs> but you might say, I, I knew this doesn't make any sense. So we have this wonderful place to start. It's called Fresh Perspective. It's Peacemaking 101. And you'd say, this just sounds a lot different than the Christianity I grew up with. It's, it is a little bit, but it's not as much as you might think. And this is a wonderful conversation group. We rotate, we, we do about four or five a year, but we're actually doing a Zoom group this, this summer. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can check that box on the back of the Connect card where we explore big ideas that, um, that are beautiful concepts that maybe have just run their course in a way of talking about them and we need to reimagine them a little bit. So during communion today, I wanna to invite you to stand if you'd like to right now. Um, we have communion set up around the room. Everybody is invited to the table. These are representations simply put to the love of God for you, for this world, that everybody's welcome to the table. And during this um, time, our team is gonna do a song called The Kingdom Is Yours. And this is a beautiful song that's really tied into this idea of who runs the kingdom <laughs> and who it belongs to and who we seek to serve and so I would encourage you during this time to just try your best to be present in the moment, to think about the lyrics. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song that we'll probably be doing more of. And it's a reminder that the kingdom is found in those who are courageously willing to be vulnerable. The kingdom is found in the poor of spirit. The kingdom is found in those who've been oppressed. And as we enter Pride Month, we recognize that the kingdom of God is found in you. Can I tell you one other thing? We'll be a little charismatic today. We'll just go as long as we need to. I think there are two people in my life that have been more of Jesus to me than anyone else, and they're Janet and Chevette. And Janet and Chevette watch still. They're, they live in Maine. And Janet and Chevette came to our church at a time um, where all of New England was uh, trying to figure things out in the church world, and they still are when it comes to issues of human sexuality and gender. And, these two beautiful people came and uh, they joined our small group, came into our home every week and just loved us and we loved them. And I was serving at a church at the time that was welcoming but not affirming. And so that just means that we were liars, um, truth be told. Uh, and, and you could come and you could serve in certain capacities if you were a member of the queer community but you couldn't teach because of traditional teachings and things like that. And, we were on a journey, this was two decades ago, and, and Jan and Shabet just loved us. They just stuck with us. And after they had been in our group for a couple of years, um, they came and they asked me to do their marriage, and I wasn't allowed to, and I told them no. And I tell you this, this is part of my story. And it's not fair to deny parts of us that we're not proud of, but, but they came and said, hey, would you do our wedding? And I said, I can't. And I could have if I wanted to. <laughs> I could have, and I'm, I mean, that's the truth of what happens in my journey is I just made the decision at some other, but I looked at him and I said, I, 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 I'm not allowed. And, and we had this beautiful, and I said, you know how much I love you and you all are changing me, you're shaping me because everything I've been told and taught in my religious upbringing, you're shattering because you're becoming more full of the fruits of the spirit and all the things that aren't supposed to happen in your life are happening in your life and you are transforming me. And so if you'll just love me and be patient and we'll love you and, and they did that and I didn't deserve it. So the kingdom is theirs. And so if you are here today and your family um, was ever subject to that faith that I lived and portrayed, the kingdom is yours. And thank you for being Jesus to me. And thank you for transforming me. And Pride Month is important. It is. And so 
as you come to the table today, as we enter into this month, there are just, there's a lot of suffering still there. And, and, uh, and I'd rather have people who exclude tell me that I don't know Jesus than continue to have lived in that life of contradiction and exclusion and the lack of love. And so I'm grateful for those of you that have loved me and loved us in spite of uh, the really bad theology that we inherited and the way in which we lived. And so your forgiveness is wonderful and appreciated and hopefully transformative of you. So thank you for loving your enemy and turning me into an ally. The body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you.